okay, we only have one open issue left, login. So this is our goal. We want user to provide username and password to login. To make things interesting, if a user is not logged in, then the user can still find all artifacts and find all wizards. But if a user is not logged in, this user cannot find all users. Okay, so we're trying to secure this API, but for APIs here in wizards and in artifacts, we're not gonna secure them. This is just example. I think in reality, you should also want to secure, for example, like delete artifact or delete wizard. Okay, this is just example. Okay, so let's go to IntelliJ and let's create a new branch. Let's call it login. Then how do we secure our APIs? Or in other words, how do we do authentication and authorization for our Spring Boot application? Which is very important for basically every application. We need login, right? If you remember when we first created this project, in IntelliJ. And there is a panel that asks us to select dependencies, you know, the modules. So we picked something like Spring Web MVC. We can pick Timeleaf. We didn't pick it this time, right? We picked H2. We also picked Spring Data GPA. There's also something called security. And under security, there is an option called Spring Security. So in this video, we're going to use Spring Security to secure all the APIs. It is a very powerful security framework that offered by Spring Boot team. Okay, first of all, we have to import the dependency. In other words, have our project depend on Spring Security. How to do that? Since we cannot go back to the panel and click that Spring Security, we have to manually import Spring Security. So now let me show you how do we do that. We're going to use Maven. So first, let's go to Google and search Maven Spring Boot Security Starter. Okay, make sure you search Starter, not just Spring Security. Okay, so go to Chrome. Maven Spring Security Starter. Okay, so the full name is called Spring Boot Security Starter. All right, when you download, make sure you download this one, not Spring Security. Okay, so they are both Spring Security but this is really a modified version for Spring Boot because we're using a Spring Boot project. Okay, the version is 2.2.6, that's fine, because this is the same version with our Spring Boot, right? So this is the Maven Central. Remember, as I told you before, Maven will go here and download the artifacts. Now, this is the one that we're interested in, so just copy. Oh, by the way, besides Maven, uh, we also have Gradle. This is the syntax for Gradle. If you're using Gradle as a build tool for a Spring Boot application, you copy this. And there are others, but we use Maven. So here is a dependency, and inside dependency we have coordinates, group ID, artifact ID, and a version. So those three can help Maven uniquely identify one artifact. I have already copied on my clipboard. Then let's go to palm.xml. Okay, so scroll down. As you can see, when we create this project, we already import some dependencies like uh, Spring Boot Data GPA, uh, Spring Web MVC, Spring DevTools. Now here is H2, remember? In order to use H2, you have to have your project depend on H2 in memory database. Okay, we also have test. That's why we can use GUnit and Marketo. All right, so after here, uh, we probably want to put it in the end, right? Why not? Down here. Okay, don't mess up the tags. So paste. Okay, and you do not need this version because our palm has already extended a parent palm. So the versions there are predefined, but it doesn't hurt if you put a version there. But uh, as you can see, we don't have to include the version. So this is the group ID, this is the artifact ID. All right. Now also, we need to click this uh, refresh. Now if you don't have this refresh, uh, let's go to Maven here and we can click this refresh. So basically what happened here is, if you look at here, it's very fast, it's resolving. 
is Maven is going to search if this artifact is available in your local repo. Okay, by the way, this local repo is not the Git repo, it's really the Maven local repo, remember? The .m2 hidden directory. So if it's not there, then Maven will go to Maven Central, the website I just showed you, and pull it down, install it locally, and your project can deploy it. All right, so to verify, let's open this and open dependencies. Now, as you can see, here are the dependencies of our project. We have data, we have web, and this is security. Okay, now, now this security also depends on dependencies. Okay, uh, as you can see, those are here. Now, why there is a grid out? Now, grid out means this artifact is already downloaded. Okay, so even though you are depending on it, but I'm not going to download again. So it's omitted for duplicates. That means the previous artifacts have already downloaded this one. Okay, that's why Maven is really an awesome tool because it refuses to download duplicates, which can help you save some space. Okay, after we have imported Spring Boot Starter Security, let's launch our program and see what is different. So launch our program. So it's starting. Okay, it looks like Spring Security gives us a generated security password, okay? And also here, Tomcat started on 8080. Okay, then let's go to Postman again. Do you remember we're finding all users? So without Spring Security, if I click send, we got one, two, three, three users, okay? No surprise. Now this time, so this is before security was introduced. And after we change our palm.xml, we import Spring Security. Let's see what is changed. So now if I click send, all right. Now this time it says unauthorized, okay? It's refusing to provide me the users. So this is what happened. By default, if you add line 54 to 57 in it and refresh, you know, and launch it again, Spring Security will block everything okay that means you need a password for everything now the what is the password do you remember in the console this password right here okay so this is a auto generated security password so that means every request you have to attach this password let's go to the browser okay so let's use browser to access this localhost 8080 users okay now remember before security we can see those users in the browser but this time if i press enter okay spring boot automatically redirect me to this login page okay now so spring boot team has this login page built in and as you can see the default one is login so that means anything will be redirected to this url login i can put my username and the password here okay Let's try to type username and password, the default ones. So first, let's go back to IntelliJ and let me copy this password. The default username is user. So just user, paste, and then I sign in. Now, once I sign in, uh, it will fulfill my request, which is users. Okay, as you can see, we can get three users. So this is the default behavior when you bring in Spring Security. However, we do not want all users to share one password, right? So we really want to create our own username and password, save it in our database. So a user comes in, can provide the credentials, and we will talk to the database to verify if everything is correct. Next, I'm going to show you how to implement that using Spring Security. As you have seen in the previous example, by simply adding the four lines in palm.xml, our project gets Spring Security. The default behavior of Spring Security is that it will secure every single endpoint or API of your application. But remember our task? We only want to secure find all users. So if a client has not logged on, this client is okay to find all artifacts and find all wizards. I'm sure every project that uses Spring Security wants to customize it to make 
the security requirement in line with your own requirement. So let's do it. Right click and let's create a new package. In this case, we're going to create a configuration class to config Spring Security. But first, let's create a package to hold this class. And we call it config. Because later on, we probably will add more configurations. Spring Security configuration is just one of them. Then right click this package, new a Java class. We can call it Spring Security Config. This is a good name for configuration class. In Spring Boot, we need to use an annotation called add configuration to annotate this class. Basically, we're telling Spring that, hey, please create an instance of this class and treat it as a bin. So Spring will take over the lifecycle of an instance of this class. So basically, this is another bin. All right. We need to have this class extends a class from Spring Security. It is called Web Security Configural Adapter. As you can see, this is from Spring Security. All right, next, let's add the second annotation to the class. It's called Enable Web Security. Same, this annotation is from Spring Framework Security. Okay, now, once our class extends this Web Security Configural Adapter, we can override some methods defined in this parent class. And in this case, we're going to redefine or override two methods, and they're both called config. So let's work on them one by one. Config, as you can see, there are two config methods from the parent class. Now this time, we're going to override the first one. Delete this. Remember, we want to config Spring Security to make sure that it opens some APIs or endpoints and secure some APIs. So let me show you how to do that. So we're going to use the form parameter HTTP dot authorize requests dot and matchers. And inside, we're going to write some ant patterns. Now the first one is we do not want to block H2 console. Well, I didn't show this to you, but by default, you no longer can access localhost 8080 forward slash h2 dash console. So first, we need to make sure this one is dot permit all. In other words, this is open, Spring Security, you do not have to authenticate. Okay, next, I'm going to keep chaining those end measures. Now remember, we do not want to block artifacts. So anything that starts with artifacts, forward slash, and this can be anything, right? This, this uh, wildcard means anything. Also, permit all. Now, same thing for wizards. And matchers. Wizards. Dot. Permit all. We also want to expose users forward slash login. Out matchers. Users. Login. Because it would be very silly to block login because I want to log in, but you're blocking that API. So this API, this login API should always be public. Okay. Even if you have never logged in because you want to log in in the first place. All right. Other than that, we should block. Okay. Out matchers. Now make sure that the order that you define those out matchers, those patterns really matter. Okay. So the last one, we're going to block this users. And here we're going to say authenticated. So this one means this URL needs authentication to be executed. So if the client has not logged in and issue localhost 8080 forward slash users and using get, then the server will refuse to return a list of users. All right, next, out matchers, let me show you something else. This time we're going to pass two arguments to this out matchers. The first one is HTTP method dot delete. Okay, we're going to make sure that 
only a user, a authenticated user, that's not enough. But this user has to have authority admin to delete other users. Okay. So here we're going to have users asterisk asterisk dot has authority. And of course, you can have uh, multiple authorities, but here we have to have one authority, which is admin. Okay, I'm going to define this later on. All right, so it's getting longer. And we're going to still enable form login. And we're going to change the login process URL to be users login. Because by default, the login process URL is forward slash login, as you have seen in the previous example. But this time, uh, to make sure we conform to the API documentation, I want to change the login process URL. So when we log in, we're going to go to localhost 8080 forward slash users forward slash login, not localhost 8080 forward slash login. Okay, so those are enough for our simple demo. Now, in reality, when in production, you probably want to be more fine-grained and define a very long chained ONT matchers. Last but not least, before we finish config, let me add two more lines. One is HTTP dot CSRF. If you know this, it means cross-site request forgery. Now, by default, it is on, but since we're using a REST, in other words, maybe our front end and backend, they're not on the same server. So I have to disable this, otherwise you couldn't log in. Okay, however, let me come back here. However, if you are developing using Timeleaf or GSP, uh, they are on the same server, you know, the front end and the backend on the same server, then I highly recommend you do not disable it. Okay, because the whole point is to prevent CSRF, cross-site request forgery. Next, uh, here is from my own experience. Now. Even if you have done this, okay, if you go to H2 console, you can access that website. However, uh, everything, all the frames will be blocked. They're not visible. So I figured it out you have to do something like this. Okay, headers dot frame options dot disable. Okay, so the last one is only for H2. Okay, this is for H2 console. Okay, because without this one, you couldn't even see anything, all the tables in the H2 console. Okay, so make sure you have these two lines added after this. So let's go ahead and test. I'm going to launch it. Let's first go to H2 to see if we can access H2. Localhost 8080 H2 console. So if our configuration works, then we should access this without any problem. Good, we can access it. Then connect, there's no problem. So select user, we can see all the users, username, roles, password, enabled, and their ID. Okay, as you can see, in this case, only John, based on our configuration, only John has the authority to delete a user. Eric, Tom, they can log in, they can view all the users, but they cannot delete anything. So that's our very simple story. And also in our table, we have username and password. Okay, later on, I'm going to talk about how to verify username and password. In other words, how to log in, right? How, how does a new user log in? Okay, also let's verify this. Can we find all artifacts? Right now, we haven't logged in yet, right? So this is a brand new request. Remember, in the previous example, we couldn't even get any artifacts. So send, all right, is uh, the same. We got all the artifacts. Now, what about find all wizards? So send, all right, no problem, okay. Now, this time, what about find all users? So click here, why is empty? So localhost, users, Save. Okay, so make sure you know in our configuration, if you're gonna find all users, this needs authentication. Okay, 
and we haven't been authenticated yet, right? So let's go to Postman and press Send. Okay, now we got a problem, right? The problem is, so let's, let me scroll up. It says, please log in, right? So we received the entire page, okay? The entire login page. Okay, so this is not truly RESTful, but basically it means that you cannot just uh, find all users without login, okay? If this happens in the browser, the browser will render the return value. Select so like this, like this one, okay? All right. Now you know how to open some endpoints and secure some endpoints using Spring Security. Our next task is how to log a user in. So before we start implementing, let's kind of briefly review the login process. Here is an oversimplified description of how Spring Security help you authenticate a user. We'll request with username and password, in this case, John123456, comes to the server. Spring Security will use a filter, actually many filters, to capture this request. I hope you guys still remember the concept filter when we learn Java Servlet. That's right, behind the scenes, Spring Security is using filters and many filters. So some requests, the filter will let it go, let it pass. Some request needs authentication or authorization. The request comes to authentication provider, and there can be many kinds of authentication providers. So this provider will use user service and DAO to retrieve the correct credentials from database because all the user information are stored in our database. They will compare. If everything's correct, then a principle will be created. By the way, in Spring Security, a principle represents a logged in user and return success to the client. Otherwise, we return failure to the client. Okay, so this process is really simple. Then what we should do, we means the developer of our Spring Boot application. We need to modify our user service and user DO to make sure that we can reply authentication provider's request that is found by username or found by username and password. We should also let authentication provider know the existence of user service because this guy and this guy, they're the two beans that really work with database, retrieve, query. So the authentication provider really delegates the work of finding user by username to user service. Of course, user service then will call user DO to find it from database. Okay, so let's go back to IntelliJ and implement this. Remember, we have to modify user service, we have to modify user DAO, and we also have to add a new class under domain package. I will show you what that is. So first, let's work on modifying our current user service class. So this is our current user service class. It depends on DO, find all, find by ID, save, update, delete by ID. But there's no find user by username and password, something like that. In other words, right now, our user service does not support authenticating a user. Okay, then how do we modify it? It turns out that Spring Security provides an interface and Spring Security requires that our user service class implement this interface provided by Spring Security. So we're gonna have our class implements this interface. It is called user details service. As you can see, this is an interface provided by Spring Framework Security. Okay, now it's complaining because we need to implement a method defined in this interface. So click implement method. Okay, so by reading the name, you know the purpose of this method. Load user by username, which is equivalent to find user by username. And of course, the input is username. The authentication provider will call this method automatically. And as a developer, you do not have to worry about it. Okay, then how do we find user by username? 
service will not talk to database directly. So we have to rely on user DAO. But right now, user DAO only supports the basic CRUD. That is, find all, find by ID, save, update, and delete. There's no way we can find by one column, like in this case, username. Remember, username is a column in our user table. So if you don't believe me, you can try user DAO dot find by, we only have find by ID. So we cannot proceed. Let's modify user DAO right here. As you can see, by extending it, we got CRUD for free, but you can only do CRUD. What we want to do is, can we add our own query? Can we make it more flexible? And the answer is yes. That's why we really like Spring Boot, is you get something for free, something predefined, but you can also be flexible. So here's how we define find by username. It is just like this. Of course, this one returns a user, right? And the method name is find by user name. So what I did here is I defined a method signature in this interface. Remember, in interface, you cannot define implementation. Then who will provide implementation to this find by username signature? Spring Data GPA. That's right. So if you are using this name convention, find by, and here is the name of a column. So where is my user class? Right here. As you can see, this is username. If you follow this naming convention, that is find by, followed by any private field name. For example, we can do find by username, or we can say find by password. Well, even though this doesn't really make a lot of sense, right? Because we never find a user by password. But what I want to tell you is that this is valid. In other words, Spring Data GPA will provide an implementation and really find by password. Now, we also can find by enabled. Of course, here really should be a list of users because there may be many users that are enabled. Well, we don't use this method. So the first time I learned this, I was amazed. That is, no more need to learn SQL. All you need to do is know how to name your method. Okay, but of course, if you name your method like this, this won't work, okay? Because there's no private field called username one. So even though there's no error here, when you execute it, Spring Data GPA cannot provide an implementation for find by username one because we don't have this field. Okay, so let's take all those. And also we do not need this list. Okay, that's it. No more SQL. Just know how to name your method. Also, now what if I want to find by two fields, like find by username and password? Now here is a naming convention. You use and. Okay, so make sure that this username and password, they are consistent with here, username and password. Okay, and this and must be in here. Okay, this and must be in here. In my lecture notes, I included a link to Sprint Data GPA's documentation that explains how to name your method. And those methods are called derived query methods. So no more SQL is needed. Okay, so let's change it back because Sprint Security only requires us to find by username. Okay, so we're down here. Now at this time, service can use user DAO dot find by username and also pass the username in. So let's call this user. All right, so there are two results, okay? The first one is there is really a user that had the same your name. And the second possibility is there is no such user. So first, I'm gonna tell if the return value is 
null or not. So if user is null down here, so let me write an if else to make it to make the logic more clear. We're going to throw an exception. Now this exception is also from Sprint Security. It's called username not found. I'm going to pass username in. Okay. Well, in production, besides throwing this exception, you probably also want to log it in a logger. Okay. So if user is not null, that means we do have this user. Okay. So we're going to return a new. Okay. Behold. This time I'm going to call it my user principal. Now remember, I said if the user does exist, a principal is generated. That principal basically represents a logged in user. Okay. We haven't defined this class yet. So let me define this principal class now. As you can see, this principal class will be very similar to our user class, but this is a wrapper class that wraps our user. Okay. So let me copy the name and under domain, we're going to create this principle. All right, then what makes a class a principle class? The class must implement an interface provided by Spring Security. So implements user details. So as you can see, User details is also from Spring Framework Security. Okay, as you can see, it's not happy. That means we have to implement some unimplemented methods in this interface. So just uh, hover your cursor over and click implement methods. Well, there are a lot, right? So we got to get authorities, get password, get your name, and also some boolean method. Return. All right, there are a lot. Also remember, if we come back to service, the constructor accepts our user. So that means we need to have a private field. It's called private field called user. And also create a constructor. All right, now we have to import it here. It's not complaining. Good. So pay attention to this one. Load user by username is not returning a user, but is returning something called user details. As you just saw, user details is from Sprint Framework Security. It provides core user information. And in user details, which is this guy here, we encapsulate this entire user. And in this user, we got ID, username, password, and roles. Okay. Up until now, I'm sure some students feel confused. Oh my God, we got a user, we got a principal, and what's going on, right? So let's pause a little bit and look at our picture again. 